Welcome everybody to the July edition of the Node.js and Oracle Database Office Hours. We don't intend to show you anything you can't already do today, although if we slip and mention something that may be coming in the future, just don't make any purchasing decisions based on what we say. Who are we? I'm Dan McGann, a developer advocate here at Oracle. I focus on the Node.js community. We have Anthony Tuninga here as well. He is the lead developer on Node Oracle DB, as well as another number of other scripting drivers. Christopher Jones is the product manager for all those scripting drivers. And then Blaine Carter is on my team. He's a developer advocate that focuses on open source, which of course includes Node.js. If you've not yet attended an office hour session before, the basic idea is to give you a chance to talk to us directly. If you have any questions or concerns, feel free to let us know. We'll start off with an icebreaker topic and then leave some time open at the end for basic Q&A. Please use the chat feature until the end to ask any questions you may have. You may find that feature in the Zoom panel. It might be hidden under more depending on your resolution, but you can find that feature and use it at any point in time. So that icebreaker topic today is going to be GraphQL. I'm using some slides from a previous talk I did on this subject. We're going to start with a high-level overview of GraphQL and then talk about the type, system, and query language, and then we'll go into a demo. So what is GraphQL? Simply put, it's a query language for APIs. This was created by Facebook, who at the time was dealing with a number of issues with existing specs uh, and just implementations of APIs, which we'll talk about in more detail as we go. But technically, it's really not just one thing. It's four uh, main parts. So there's a type system, there's a query language, static validation, and type introspection. We'll touch on some of these as we go. GraphQL started back in 2012 as an internal project at Facebook. They released a spec publicly in 2015, and they've been doing regular updates since then. Currently, in 2019, it's one of the hottest words in tech. So everybody's sort of jumping on the GraphQL bandwagon. That includes Oracle. We know of at least one team within Oracle that's using GraphQL pretty heavily. Uh, but as you can see, there's another a number of other really big names here, including, and I think this one's a big one, uh, GitHub. So we all use GitHub today, and I just want to show you real quick. If you search GitHub API, first link you'll see is to V3 of their API. You can see that it is a REST API. If you go to the docs, look at V4. They have dropped REST entirely in favor of GraphQL. So that just kind of gives you an indication of how seriously some of these folks are taking GraphQL at this point. I mentioned that Facebook released a spec. Actually, they released two things, a spec and an implementation. So the spec is the general guidelines for how an implementation of GraphQL should work. And then they released the reference implementation in JavaScript for GraphQL. It's not the only implementation in JavaScript. There are uh, a number of others, uh, notably from Apollo. That's the other big one. Uh, but they all just follow the same rules to find in the spec. And of course, you'll find another a number of other implementations in other languages, such as Java, any, any language really where it makes sense to build it. I mentioned that Facebook was trying to tackle a number of issues that they had with existing API protocols at the time. One of those issues is underfetching. So imagine you have a web page and you want to display data related to both employees and departments. Well, with the typical REST API, these are separate entities, so you might have to go issue a request to, to get some employee data and then a separate request to get some uh, department-related data. So these additional round trips do have a cost, and it's known as underfetching. You weren't able to get all the data you needed in a single request. You had some underfetching issues. You had to keep going back for more. That was one problem. Another was related to overfetching, so sort of the reverse. With typical REST APIs, the server determines what comes back in the request. And so there may be, with like an employee endpoint, uh, a bio or a biography, which you have no interest in for your particular web page, uh, but that would come back across the wire anyway. So that was another issue. 
there seemed to be a little bit of overhead with respect to URLs, developers having to think in terms of URLs in turn, instead of the actual types and fields that they were after. So with GraphQL, that kind of changes around. Rather than having many different endpoints, you have a single smart endpoint, and you can just tell the server what you want. Another issue they were trying to tackle was related to versioning of APIs. With REST APIs, you've probably seen uh, like a V1 and a V2 as things get versioned on. That can be really tricky to deal with with REST. But with GraphQL, there's built-in support for versioning. You can, for example, deprecate a field and eventually phase that out rather than having completely separate versions of your API. Here's a high-level comparison of REST to GraphQL. The first two are the same. Both work over HTTP and can return JSON, although they're not limited to JSON, either one. But things start to differ with the third point on. So the endpoint for REST will be the object identity, whereas with GraphQL, the object identity is simply part of the query. With REST, resource, uh, the resource is determined by the server. You have no control over what comes back when requesting data. Whereas with GraphQL, the server simply says what's available, and then the client can request only what it needs for its particular use case. With REST, you may have to go after multiple URLs to get the data you need. With GraphQL, you can request all the data in a single request. Really, really nice and neat. With REST, you had to use different HTTP verbs to indicate the type of action you wanted to perform against the resource. With GraphQL, we have different queries and mutations which are exposed, uh, and I'll show you how that works in a little bit, um, but you don't have to worry about HTTP verbs. And with REST calls, all calls are stateless, whereas with GraphQL query and mutations are stateless, but there is another, which I'll mention, that uh, is stateful for subscriptions. The simple way I like to think of GraphQL, you know, we've had SQL that we can use from the mid-tier against the database for a very long time. SQL is known to be the world's most popular language for working with data. It's extremely powerful, flexible. It's a great language, but it's not great if you're a front-end developer. Uh, you may not be familiar with executing uh, SQL queries, and it can be uh, tricky to learn. GraphQL is essentially SQL for front-end developers. They get a similar type of flexibility uh, that we're used to and familiar with in SQL, but they don't have to learn all the uh, things that go into SQL or that make that language so powerful. All right, let's dive into the type system in query language. So the type system basically allows you to describe the types of objects that are going to be in your API. Uh, so employees and departments, for example. There is a schema definition language that you can use to define how that schema shape and the types will work. And it's built up or comprised of a number of scalar types at the uh, bottom end. So ID, int, float, string, and boolean are your basic types. And there are other more complex types like object, interface, and so on. Um, but we won't be getting into those. But like SQL, uh, the basics are simple, but there's definitely enough to keep you busy there for quite a while as you're learning GraphQL. There are three main types of operations in any GraphQL API. The one we'll be working with today is just query. So you can think of that like issuing select statements in a database. There are mutation operations. Those are easily mapped to data manipulation language, insert, update, and delete in the database. And then you can also do subscriptions and the database feature, at least within Oracle, that this most closely maps to is continuous query notification, or CQN for short. Now, I've not seen anyone do it, but I'd love to see someone take a shot at creating a GraphQL API that has a subscription operation, and it's backed by a CQN query in the database. That'd be really cool to see. All right, so let's start with something hopefully everybody here knows, um, some data modeling. You notice the schema here is uh, OBE, that's for Oracle by example, but what we're really looking at is an M and then a depth table. These are very simple tables. You can see the column names on the left, there are data types on the right. So we have some numbers, some strings and dates, a simple foreign key from depno over to department. Basic data modeling, right? Well, if you use a data modeler to develop something like this, that tool will probably have the ability to generate some DDL for you. So this is an example of how we would actually turn that into something real in the database. We would execute this code here. And you see we're creating the EMP table. You can see the columns and their data types. Well, I mentioned that there's a schema definition language for GraphQL. It's very much like DDL is for databases. The way this would look 
in GraphQL schema language is like this. So similar, but actually a lot simpler. This is what I mean by it's easier for front end devs to learn than it would be for something like SQL. So here you can see we're creating a type called emp. You can see its attributes and their simple data types. The bang in this case just means that it is required. So we have integer, we have string. Down here you're seeing manager, which is an emp. So this is like a self referential foreign key constraint. And then down here with depth, you're seeing a pointer over to another type entirely, which is depth. So pretty cool, pretty easy to learn. Once you've defined the types that you want to have available in your API, you then need to define what's known as a query root. And the way to think of a query root is that this is the entry point for all the queries that your API will support. So in this case, I have a department type, I have an employee type, and I'm allowing queries on both of these types. But hey, maybe I'll have this department type because it's a part of the empl employee type, but I don't want to allow anyone to directly query departments. That's fine. I could eliminate these two lines here, and then my queries would only be employee and employees. So once you've defined your query route, you can then roll that up into what's known as a schema. And the schema is just the entry point for those three operation types I mentioned before. So we have query, mutation, and subscription. And the only one I'm gonna support here is basic query operations. And these are the four that folks can run against this API. Pretty simple stuff. So get a couple examples here before we get into the actual demo. So with a REST request, we might issue a get against department slash one. What we get back is whatever the server wants to give us. So in this case, we get three fields. And the shape of the data, uh, who knows what you're gonna get back. Again, it's whatever the server wants to give us. With GraphQL, the query looks a little bit different. You can see the shape is very different. We're passing parameters differently. And we are listing the fields we want back. And the shape of the response matches the actual query, which is a very nice feature of GraphQL. You can see that location field at the bottom. If I didn't want the location field, I could simply omit it. And then the response we get back doesn't include it. So we don't have to drag that across the wire, which when you're dealing with mobile applications especially, that can be a big deal. All right, let's do a quick demo. So the demo I'm gonna do is technologies. In the front end, I have uh, GraphQL. This is included, it's just a, a user interface for playing with GraphQL that's included with the reference implementation provided by Facebook. And then in the mid-tier, I'm using Express, Express GraphQL, GraphQL, that's that reference implementation. I'm using JoinMonster, which I'll explain in a little bit. And then of course, Node Oracle DB to execute our queries against the Oracle database, which we're using for persistence. All right, let's get into it. So I will do a brief code walkthrough here, starting with our GraphQL schema. And I mentioned we have, uh, start with departments, since that's really simple. So what you saw before was the schema definition language means uh, of defining a schema. And I could have used that, but each language that supports GraphQL is going to have uh, its own unique types. And uh, these types just refer to the types that uh, are included with GraphQL or part of that specification. So all those scalars and so on. And what I'm doing here is rather than using the schema definition language, I'm using the lower level programmatic APIs to build up my types. So I'm bringing in a few types from GraphQL. And then you see down here, I'm creating a, a new object type. This is for the department. And I'll describe it. I'll give it a name. And then I'll define the fields that are on this particular type. So it has ID, name, and location. And what you're seeing here uh, are the basic data types. So ID is going to be an int, name will be a string, and location will be a string. But you're also seeing something that's not going to be in most GraphQL APIs. That's a SQL column. And the reason you're seeing that is uh, I'm using a library to help generate SQL queries for me. Uh, actually, does some pretty cool work. So it has hooks that it's looking for in my, in my types. Uh, SQL column simply maps to the correct column where I can get that data. And then down below, you'll see I'm also mapping to the table, as well as specifying the unique key or column for that table. And the depth, by the way, this isn't the traditional HR schema, although there are a set of tables, emp and depth, which are fairly common and easy to find um, if you wanna play with these tables on your own. 
So that's one schema. Was there a question in the queue? I cannot find the chat. Let me read it to you. It says, looks to me like the new polymorphic table functions could be a good helper on the Oracle side for this. <laughs> I would love uh, to actually know uh, if that's true or not, but I have yet to actually really dive into polymorphic table functions. I will have to take your word for it instead. All right, so here's one that's a little bit more complex. Uh, this is employee.js. Note that I'm bringing in departments, which I just showed you. I'm doing something similar, although I'm creating a new type for employee, just describing it, giving it the name. You have additional fields, but here you're seeing that self-referential foreign key constraint, and join monster allows me to specify how a SQL join operation should work. It's gonna pass me in table one and table two. In this case, it's the same, really. And I can specify how that join works. Uh, down here, you're seeing something similar for department. Again, SQL join, how that should work and how it relates to the, the department's table. So once we have those two in place, I'm gonna roll those into a query root. So here I'm bringing both employees and departments in. These are my custom types. And then I bring in, uh, or create rather, a query root with a new object type. So we have the query root, and here are the four fields or entry points into my API. I have employee, employees, department, and departments for single and then multiple rows coming back. So with employee, this one is going to require an ID argument, and we describe that argument here. And again, with query monster, it's looking for the where clause and how that should work. Uh, and then you have resolvers as well. This is uh, a common part of GraphQL. Resolvers, of course, going to resolve uh, what folks are querying. And this is where join monster comes in. So I use join monster to take in that resolve info and context information that's passed to it from the GraphQL implementation, the reference implementation. And it does the heavy lifting for me, uses those little hooks I've already shown you, and then gives me a SQL query. And I'm gonna go ahead and log out that SQL query so we can actually see what it's doing for us. But then I just take the SQL it gives us and I use the database driver to execute that and supply any bind variables that are necessary as well. It's an important point uh, when using query uh, join, join monster or any of these other tools, be very uh, careful anytime you're taking in data supplied by end users, you need to uh, use bind variables or properly escape it, but be very careful with that so you don't open yourself up to SQL injection vulnerabilities. All right, so that's uh, it in a nutshell. Once I have this done, the query root, of course, I just uh, bring that in to the schema. And in this case, we're only gonna support the query operation. So there's that query root I defined before. Now what I wanna do is start this guy up. So I'll come back up a directory. And we'll start her up. Oops, looks like it's already running somewhere. Others tab. Close that. Try it again. There we go. And I'm pointing to this port, and GraphQL is what will get me into, or GraphQL will get me into GraphQL. And you can see here uh, what a basic query looks like. So if this were blank, and you wanted to know, hey, where should we start with a query? Well, because I've gone through the work of defining my types and sort of surfing, surfacing those up into GraphQL, GraphQL already knows everything that's possible or that could be done with this particular API. So what I can do is open this up. I can go into the query root and see, okay, these are the endpoints and this is what they return. So employee, for example, takes in an employee ID as an integer. And I can look inside of employee and I can see, oh, okay, these are the different types and fields that are available, right? So if I back that up, this is what a query looks like. I'm saying employee ID 7689 and just give me the name field. So if I fire that off, you can see the result in here. I'm getting my data back and the employee name in this case is Blake. But if I wanted additional fields, like I'm looking on the right, there's job. I can add that, fire it off, and now I'm getting back the job. 
if I wanted to go further, say bring in a manager, I could do that. But a manager is not a simple type. It needs additional fields, so it's gone ahead and added that for me. And I could do the same thing because this is just another uh, employee. I could say give me the name and uh, job as well. So we can just add those in here and get that data back. So this is what makes GraphQL so powerful. If I go back and show you what Join Monster is doing for us, that last query is here. So it's doing a left join on uh, the correct table to pull back the necessary data. But if I drop these fields and reissue that query, you can see it skips the join altogether because it's not necessary. So what Join Monster is doing is making it very easy for me to issue dynamic SQL against the database in a safe and performant way. That's it in a nutshell. See a question come in, is there an equal element for SQL's star or must I always specify all fields I want to retrieve? It's a good question. I'm unaware of there being a star. Uh, however, most of the time you're issuing a star, it's when you're sort of learning about the database. And again, for, for GraphQL, we sort of have that built in via the introspection capabilities. So you would just come over here, learn what's available and query only that. I think it's, it's that overfetching that they're trying to address, right? Say what you want, not just bulk and drag additional details across the wire. Say only what you need and get that data back. I think that's the idea. Going back to Niels's first comment about the polymorphic tables, um, should probably point out that SODA is also a good fit here, although you don't get the join monster capabilities. But so do the document style access is very nifty and neat for anything in the web world nowadays. It's a very fair point, but Soda comes with its own, you know, query by example capabilities. I, I've I've only sort of thought about this. I haven't attempted an implementation, but you can have any parameters you want here. So if we had like an employee collection for Soda, we might create a custom type, like a um, th this might be QBE for example, um, and, and allow some means of, of users uh, leveraging that capability that's built in. And you might not even need Join Monster at all for Soda. That might be pretty cool to see as well. All right, that's it for the demo. Actually, let me just check real quick. I might've had some additional queries to show off. Well, this is a good one. Let me, let me show you this one. And the reason is uh, that underfetching ability. So I mentioned that we could uh, solve the issue of underfetching, get all the data we need for a single uh, web page or view without multiple round trips. So you see here, I'm going after, well, this is still all in a single query called emp. Uh, let me just add. So if I do it like this, uh, what I just want to show off is that this is a single query. I can call this, uh, let's say, M and depth. And so now you see in one query, I'm getting multiple entities back. This is just something I wanted to point out that you could do, uh, which is not something that you could do with a typical REST API. All right, that's it for the demo. Uh, a few closing thoughts here. REST isn't going anywhere anytime soon. And in fact, it actually still has a few advantages over GraphQL. Uh, but GraphQL is very powerful. It's giving end users uh, some features that they just haven't had before and a lot of power that they haven't had before. So definitely keep GraphQL on the radar as it looks like things are moving in that direction. If you're looking for some more info, these links, by the way, are already available on the Office Hours page for this session. Uh, but these are some of my favorite links for GraphQL. The home for GraphQL is the first link maintained by Facebook. The second one uh, is third party, but excellent resources, uh, video-based learning there. Uh, of course, you got to check out the spec if you're into the lower level details. And if you want a good and unbiased comparison of REST and GraphQL, you cannot beat this link here. Really, really great resource. 
okay, at this point, if anybody has any questions, and these questions don't have to be related only to GraphQL, uh, feel free to ask. And also, if you'd like to unmute yourself at this point, I think it's safe to do so. So feel free to do that as well. So use either chat or voice. Either one is fine. So, so Dan, while people are doing that, I will just point out that we are you know, in the end stages of getting the Node Oracle DB version 4 driver out 4.0, so quite a big release. All of the code that we have is out there on GitHub and people can compile if they go and look at uh, GitHub issue 1053. It has all of the details there. There are some binaries from a, a week or so ago as well. Um, and what we really need to, to get this bedded down is people to be testing, particularly that object functionality. So we now support object binding for SQL and PL SQL types, query and binding. Um, and we really need to get some sort of feedback on how that plays, how you like it, how you're working with the, those less tricky ty uh, types, the, the timestamps and dates and numbers and things like that. Um, and just let us know, you know, does it work, doesn't it work, what do we need to change? Because if we ship 4.0 as it is, it's going to be kind of hard to change it later. That little, you know, grotty attribute settings to, to toggle behaviors and things like that. So let's get it embedded now. Internally, we're still doing all of our you know, testing, adding functional tests and stress tests and things like that. But it definitely is the point where we need that real world experience input into it. And I know in open source, people don't test until things go production, but you know, we're hot now, we're looking at it. We've got resources, we've got the knowledge, we remember the code, you know, we don't need to, to try and work out our code comments. Um, so if you've got anything which is a, a annoying thing, let us know right now. Otherwise, you know, we may never get back to, to looking at it. That's pretty cool stuff coming. I did some testing myself and was able to reduce wrapper code drastically to work with custom types. So really looking forward to this feature. It's going to be nice. All right. Well, I do not see any questions coming in, which means everybody, mm -hmm. oh, understood what I said perfectly. No, that's the uh, tracking issue. That's the uh, details go. of the four zero yeah. development. Perfect. Cool. Well, I guess we will go ahead and call it here then. Thank you for joining, everybody, and we hope to see you next month. Do we have a topic for next month, Chris? I strongly expect that we'll be talking about 4.0. All right. Sounds good. Why not? We have already talked about it in the past, so you can find some details if you go back into the previous videos. But I'm sure it'll be time to go through what we've got, whether we've released or not. Um, hopefully we will, but uh, there's a lot to talk about. So we might need to start early and cover it over a few months. Perfect. I'll update the description then. All right. Well, thanks again for joining, everybody. And we'll see you next month. Until then, bye. Bye-bye.